Today, I'm speaking with Matt Zeman, who's the uh, founder and CEO of Happy, and who just wrote a book called Psychedelics for Everyone. Yes, we're going to speak about psychedelics, and I think I'm the perfect person to interview him because I don't know anything about it, and I'm very curious. Enjoy my conversation with Matt Zeman. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meaning podcast. And today I'm going to tackle a topic that a lot of people talk about, uh, a lot of people don't know anything about and shouldn't be talking about it. And it's also something that I'm very interested in. And those are the psychedelics. There is a guy who wrote Psychedelics for Everyone. Uh, that's a book that explains a lot of things about it. And he also founded and CEO of a company called Happy. He's got a degree in psychology and neuroscience. He's also a member of EO. Matt, Matt Zeman, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Eric, it is good to be here. I love talking to uh, fellow EO members. And uh, what you're doing is fascinating to me because uh, I have so many friends that are into it, that have done a journey or uh, whatever you, you call it, experience different things. And uh, besides cigars, I've, I've haven't uh, experienced uh, much in my life, but I'm curious and so let's maybe start with the with the beginning. And uh, what is your entrepreneurial journey that lead you to uh, the psychedelic world? So I, I have been an entrepreneur since I was a little kid. I mean, I talk about being a a second grader selling stones to the to my neighbors, just anything to uh, to make money. And in EO, sorry, I, I, so I built a number of businesses before I qualified for EO. And then in EO, I built a few businesses and they're all kind of business for business sake. I'm a good, I can build businesses. I can create teams. I can create systems. I can do the sales and marketing. I can do the fundraising. I can build a business. But uh, it wasn't all that satisfying. I, I, you know, you think about like, oh, I, I can't wait to have 100 employees. And then it's, I can't wait to have 300. And I can't wait to have 500. I can't wait to have a building with my company's name on it. And as you hit these different milestones, it, nothing really changes. It's mm. just you have more headaches and different headaches. So for me, it was like, what am I doing? Why am I just building business after business? Um, and then I had some trusted friends about a little bit uh, over three years ago who said, why don't you try one of these guided psychedelic experiences? I was like, yeah, I'm curious, but I'm not that curious. I mean, it's mm. not my thing. I've never been a drug user. It just wasn't my thing. And they're like, what do you have to lose? You love learning. Here you've read a gazillion books. This is like learning about yourself in a very different way. And you love travel. And this is like the biggest trip you could go on. So <laughs> what are you scared of? I was like, oh, all right, all right, all right. And so long story short, I ended up participating. And it blew my mind open. Um, reconnected me with my, my mom who died when she was 49. And gave me some healing and showed me a world that I just didn't know existed. And I was like, oh my God, I want to learn more about this. And as an entrepreneur, I, I want to learn about it so then I can be involved with it. Mm. And that's, that's what got me here. Interesting. Very interesting. So it's, it's not like uh, something that you've been doing for uh, many years, like a few, few years and you, you get into it fully. And then you already wrote a book about it? I did. So I dove in head first. I mean, I went from went from this experience, I got someone else to run one of the businesses that was taking a bunch of my time. And then I um, went back to school. I was a two-year program to get a master's in the psychology and neuroscience. And meanwhile, I supplemented that with kind of every psychedelic conference and a webinar I could attend. And then last year, I was able to build a company called Psychable. And the goal behind Psychable was to create a directory of psychedelic friendly practitioners, psychologists, psychiatrists, guides, shamans, and so on, and create a few hundred pieces of content on kind of all the things that, uh, that I wanted to know just in one easy place to find it. And then from there, I was able to build off of that content to put this book together. And this book, I, I put very personal stories. I have a forward by an MD, PhD, who's been working with uh, psychedelic medicine for almost 50 years. And he talks about the, the human promise and how psychedelics can unlock the human promise. And then uh, did some more, um, went medicine by medicine and put in there kind of what's the research, what are the pros and cons, how do you do this, things to be aware of, so that people could read this book who, who know nothing about psychedelics, 
and get a good understanding of how this could impact them or their people they love or their community. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to kind of have all of that, not too opinionated, not too technical, but it is all medically reviewed. Um, and I'm hoping it's just a, it's considered just a fair source of truth for uh, people who are looking for the information. Interesting. First question that comes to mind when listening to you is it, is it legal? So I, because I, I hear so, so many stories, uh, people that do ayuska, I never can. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, thank you very much. They have to go outside of the US. And then wh- what is the framework here uh, yeah. on the legal side? So in America, the only legal psychedelic in all 50 states is ketamine. So ketamine, you can get prescribed from your typically a psychiatrist or a doctor. Um, it's used off-label for mental health purposes, depression, anxiety, OCD, substance use disorders, um, any of that. And it's a um, it's a it's a very powerful medicine. It's been around since the since 1970, FDA approved since 1970. So there's a lot of papers on its safety, and it's about a one-hour experience for people. And you can do it multiple ways. In Florida, in particular, where I know you're based out of. There are a lot of um, ketamine clinics where you go in and you get hooked up to an IV or you get an intermuscular shot and you can do ketamine that way. And then there are a number of telehealth companies that will, um, you'll do a medical intake virtually, and then they will send you the medicine and you'll do it in the comfort of your home with a session companion of your choice. Um, Just another way to do it. That's about a one hour experience. Besides for that, um, there are clinical trials on a number of different medicines that people can get into. So the FDA gave breakthrough therapy designation to both MDMA and psilocybin. Um, And we all remember MDMA from the the kids in like ecstasy back in the day, but they're finding, and I'll use MDMA as an example, there's a phase three clinical trial, so heavily monitored regulated trial, looking at people with uh, treatment resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're talking Mm -hmm. about veterans, first responders, victims of sexual assault, Nothing's worked. With just two sessions of MDMA, 67% no longer qualify as having post-traumatic stress disorder. Really? It's a tremendous number. So that medicine should be legal federally within two years. And then psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, is probably what your listeners have heard of. I've done a mushroom trip. That's psilocybin. They are seeing incredible results with uh, treatment-resistant depression and anxiety, a lot of studies with terminal patients, and then also substance use for whether it's uh, trying to quit smoking or curb alcohol use, psilocybin is proving to be very, very effective. And it just, I mean, there's 309 academic institutions studying psychedelics right now. So lots and lots of research coming out. 309, 309. Yeah, I mean, I'm in Chapel Hill, and right down the street, we have University of North Carolina, which has uh, just received a $27 million grant from the Department of Defense to see if they can remove the hallucinogenic properties from psychedelics. And then the other direction, we have Duke, which has a, uh, has a new psychedelic uh, center of studies. So it's everywhere you look, because the research oh. is overwhelming. But your question was about legality. So we've mm-hmm. talked about ketamine is legal. There are clinical trials that are illegal. And then besides for those angles... Your next uh, option is to hop on a plane and go to Peru or Costa Rica or Mexico or the Netherlands, Bahamas, Jamaica, and do whatever is legal in in whichever jurisdiction you're looking at. And then beyond that, it becomes illegal activities, which I cannot condone. But if you find yourself doing that, there's ways to keep yourself safe that that I talk about in the book as well. Mm, Very interesting. You know, I was listening to you and um, it it popped into my mind that when I was 14 uh, in my hometown in Charleroi in Belgium, uh, I saw a friend crawling on the street. He was so drunk. Mm-hmm. And that really traumatized me. So I've never been in, into substance, again, besides cigars, <laughs> nothing. And so I'm listening to you. I'm listening to uh, all those, those studies that are made and, what is the the main use and why would people do that for one? And for two, what is the risk as a father of three daughters? What is the risk if a, a child tries something like that, they go into uh, drugs or they do into uh, the need of always taking it and, and, and not being able to, to live without? 
I really appreciate you asking that question because I think what you're asking is the um, is the root of a lot of people's fear. And I think that for at least for, and I'm not sure what it was like growing up in Belgium, but in America in the 70s and 80s, we had this marketing campaign, this just say no. And they had a skillet and an egg. And it was like, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. And, and we were told there's no medicinal use. These are all bad. They're going to cause permanent damage and you're going to get addicted. And uh, I don't know if you had similar messaging in, in Europe, but that's okay. So that's what we grew up with. Mm -hmm. So then we don't look at psychedelics as medicine. We look at them as these drugs and we know because we've been fed it, drugs are bad. We don't yep. look at alcohol as a drug. We don't look at tobacco as a drug. We don't look at caffeine as a drug. But we don't look at Tylenol yeah. as a drug. Caffeine is not a drug. I'm thinking <laughs> that's, a that's right. But we look at these things as drugs and then we somehow have been programmed our initial reactions, drugs, bad, going to get addicted, don't want to do it. The reality is, the quick backstory is the Nixon administration in 1970 passed the Controlled Substances Act, which is what made all of these drugs illegal under what's called a Schedule I classification, which is what no medicinal use, high rate of addiction. The reason they did that is they were trying to infiltrate the uh, anti-war left and the black communities. And by going hard on these drug laws, they were able to do that. It had nothing to do with science, nothing at all. I, so before, I take me to that because I, I, I need yeah. to know. I, I'm the type of person that understands very quickly if you explain a long time. I'll so explain a long time. What is the link between forbidding uh, th those substances yeah. and getting into uh, the hard left and, and, and the black community? So in the late 60s, you had a couple of different things happening. You had a lot of protests on the Vietnam War over here. Right. And those hippies were doing a, a fair amount of drugs. And then you had a lot of civil rights activities with the black communities and those leaders. And, and those communities, in many cases, were doing some of these drugs. So by making these drugs illegal, they could infiltrate those different organizational groups and disrupt them. But they have since said, and people who are part of that administration said, we knew this wasn't about science. This was just a tactic. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Wow. So why do I bring all this up? So before that Controlled Substances Act, what people don't realize, they think, oh, this is all new research on psychedelics. Uh-uh, thousands of papers prior to 1970 on the power of psychedelic medicine. And all the research was forced to stop. I'm 50 this year. And my Happy entire birthday. life, thank you, I, July, it just passed July. Um, my entire life, I've lived in this prohibition and I didn't even know I was there. I thought about the alcohol prohibition but it never occurred to me that I was living in just a prohibition time and that I was just being fed non-truths, non-science-based truths. So we had thousands of papers before. And then recently, in the last 10 years, there's been kind of resurgence of academic research because we haven't had a change in mental health in America since the creation of the antidepressant over 50 years ago. And things aren't working. 40% of those that tr people who try, maybe more, try antidepressants, they don't work. Even if they do work, they come with really high side effects. So we need another option. We have veterans coming back from the war, uh, or from wars, plural, not mm -hmm. able to function, mm -hmm. and not great options. So we needed something else. But So your question is, what are the dangers? Yeah. And what are the risks of addiction specifically? Totally. Um, and I'll throw a third one. What are the side effects? So when you think about the side effects of, oh, go backwards, of antidepressants, you think about things like sexual dysfunction, somewhere between 50 and 73% of people on SSRIs have sexual dysfunction. I'm not sure that's covered as, as thoroughly as it needs to be in the doctor's office. Um, gastrointestinal issues. How many people do you know are having eating challenges or issues with their stomach and are on antidepressants? It's a major, major thing that's not really talked about. For youth on antidepressants, there's a risk of suicidal ideation. So that's the opposite effect. And then you're hooked on a drug that's every day that, that's very hard to wean yourself off of. Mm. So those are pretty high side effects. Again, if they work for you and you're listening to this, great. But if they don't work, it's not that you failed the medicine, it's the medicine failed you. So then we talk about what are the side effects of psychedelics? None of those. Sometimes you have some nausea. You certainly have dissociation. That's kind of a feature, not, a, not necessarily a side effect. And then there's no 
no long-term side effects with that, that are known with side, uh, and then many are a number of psychedelics have no lethal dose. So that's kind of the, the high level side effects. You asked about the, the risks. So don't want to candy coat it. Yeah. Ketamine using that as an example, this is, a, these are, these are serious drugs that should be treated with respect with ketamine recreationally. There have been people who've gotten addicted to ketamine. It is the only psychedelic actually that has any addictive property, by the way. Every other psychedelic is anti-addictive. So we can really? chalk that one off. No one's going to say, oh, I took psilocybin. I'm going to do it again tomorrow, the next day, the next day. It doesn't work that way. But ketamine, you, there, there, are, there are cases of people getting addicted. So that's something that for medicinal use, use it in a clinic study, no addiction, but it's something to be aware of. It's, it's something to be treated with respect. The So we talked about yeah, no other medicines, uh, no other psychedelic medicines have addictions. And then in terms of danger, there's a really cool study that came out of, I think, Imperial or King's College uh, in England, where on the left-hand side, they say, what is the danger of any given medicine to yourself and to others? So on the left hand of this chart, like way high up, things like alcohol causes mm. tremendous damage to yourself, causes tremendous damage to others. Tobacco, similar. And mm. then it works its way down. And at the very end it are things like mushrooms and MDMA. Mm -hmm. Very little danger to yourself, very little danger to others. You talked about three daughters. I'll throw one more point here. The danger in our country when it comes to a lot of these drugs is because we can't have a reasonable discussion on drugs. Mm -hmm. So we therefore have illegal drugs that are being sold. And to, to I have a 17 and 19 year old, they have their people on Instagram offering them drugs. Kids don't know really what they're buying. So no, kids exactly. are dying in America every day with fentanyl overdoses who thought they bought something else. And that's because we can't have a mature discussion and have a mature marketplace. We have to do everything underground. Mm. So for parents out there who have teenagers, I highly recommend you get what's called test strips. So there's a company called Dance Safe that sells them. And let again, if you don't want your teenagers doing drugs, have that discussion with them. But if they are where their friends are, Maybe you can be the parent that provides the, the safety mechanism that just keeps them a little bit safer so that they know what they're taking when they're taking it. That's a, a very, very uh, big point here in terms of ethics, personal ethics and family choices. Um, what you were saying about the illegal drugs, um, I always compare with my experience in Belgium where basically... You know, if you're 16, 17, you can, uh, you can order beer, you can have sure. alcohol. And that doesn't prevent actually uh, problems and accident, but uh, majority of the people do it and no problem. And here, because it's forbidden, then people want to try it. And then when you can drink, oh, I'm going to get drunk in, in 15 minutes because now I can, which is, you know, always uh, blow my mind. But still going back to that, um, when you're looking at what you say about PTSD, mm -hmm. and uh, when you go to uh, the veterans coming back from wars, when you go to people that have uh, suffered uh, sexual traumas, when mm -hmm. you go to uh, kids and families that uh, experience a shooting at school, are you telling me that MDMA, you say the 67% of the case uh, in two, two mm -hmm. sessions, it's curing 67% of them? It is. It's exactly what I'm telling you. And again, it's not just the medicine by itself. They're getting therapy ahead of time. Then they're doing the two sessions of MDMA and then they're having post-therapy. But these people have all had therapy before and they've tried all the other medicines that are on the market. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I'm telling you 67% of a phase three clinical trial is showing that they no longer qualify for PTSD. Maybe it'd be helpful if we talk about kind of what these psychedelic medicines do in the brain and like, how does this work? Good point. Does that work? And let me start with the legal one that many of you, like ketamine, let's just start with that. What does ketamine do um, when you take it? So biologically, ketamine changes the glutamate activity and increases what's called BDNF in the brain, which improves the neuroplasticity and the synaptic strength. It then also works to stifle, this is the cool part, stifle the thought patterns by kind of turning down what's called the default mode network of the brain, which can provide relief from worry 
and, um, and other symptoms related to anxiety. So a lot of people, when they first take ketamine, they go, oh my gosh, it just felt like the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. And what's important about that is for many of us, especially entrepreneurs, we just carry the weight and it's become so normal, we forget we're carrying the weight until we have a moment where the weight is lifted and you go, oh crap, I remember. I used to not feel like this. I forgot. So that's a big deal. Then you start to get this, what's called disassociation side effects, which it can present itself as visuals or, or body feelings. But what it's really doing is it's unlocking subconscious thoughts and repressed memories and emotions, which helps patients kind of open up during a, it can open up during a therapy session or afterwards or with their guide, however they're taking this, it can help them unlock these things. And what it does with those most importantly is it removes what's what I call shame, blame, and guilt. Whatever, we've all had our traumas. Hold on. If you remove shame, blame, and guilt, there is no Judeo-Christian society anymore. <laughs> That's a whole different discussion. This is going to have to be a much longer podcast, and we're going to dive into that. <laughs> but that does tie into the fourth aspect of ketamine and many psychedelics is it does awaken some spiritual effect on many patients. Not everybody. And it's not, it's however you define spiritual or they define spiritual. But that helps the person connect to, a, to that greater meaning of life. And it offers kind of, kind of peace and relief from depressive symptoms or feelings of hopelessness. But the, uh, the shame, blame, and guilt is, at least for me and my experiences with psychedelics, that's the big deal. Because now you can look at something and you can look at it more so for what it was than what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And that's different. So the... I'm listening to you, Matt, and, and uh, what you say, what, the, the, what it helps. And I, I have a lot of friends that have tried it. I have many friends that told me that they had a breakthrough in their business and a new idea because they, they had some of those trips. And I think that I, I've also uh, had some uh, moments like that by meditating, by uh, conversation. So what am I missing? Or is it something that, uh, you know, you can access the same awareness, but with different ways. 100%. There's, I'm not by any stretch saying this is the only path from point A to point B. What I think is an interesting analogy or interesting to think about is there's people who meditate for years and they still are saying like, I just don't, I don't quite get it yet. I haven't had that breakthrough and it's frustrating. No one's ever taken a large amount of psychedelics and been like, oh, I didn't feel anything. I don't, it's going to show you something. And for many people, mm -hmm. it gives them an area. It's like, oh, I forgot I could feel that way. I could forgot I could feel safe and loved as, as I've just, I've been living this life and I forgot. And then when you go back to meditating, you go back to walking, you go back to your family connections and so on and so forth. You have a, a zone that you're aiming for again. So for a lot of us, it's a reminder mm -hmm. of what it was like, what it's like to be a child. One of the things I think about this first experience is, is this, this going to sound funny? I forgot what it felt like to be safe and loved. Now I'm married. I'm married 23 years this year. I've got two beautiful children. Mazel tov. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I forgot what it's like to be safe and loved because I've, I've been the provider. I've been the, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And we're going to make this happen. And this is the next deal. And it's, but fundamentally, I was doing that, I think, because I was scared that I wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. I wasn't enough just to be me. I had to be me, the provider. I had to be me, the CEO. I had to be me, the entrepreneur. I had all these different masks on that were my identity. And in that first psychedelic experience, it shattered all that and said, you are enough right now. You are loved right now. You're going to be, you are fine and you will always be fine. And when that pressure from me was removed, it's like, oh, okay. Okay, whoa, 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 let me, well, how do I want to live this next part of my life? Because I don't have to do it scared of dying and I don't really have to do it scared of providing because I can provide in my sleep. <laughs> I can't help, but I have to ask you the question as well as an entrepreneur. There is all this, uh, you, you mentioned the uh, psychedelic clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, I have friends that are invested in uh, mushroom farms uh, in other states. What is the economic of that? And uh, 
how do you see that industry going? Because I, I guess it, it's a little bit the far west right now with um, all good things and all bad things uh, all mixed together. Yeah, I think that's true. I and mean, there, there are people out there who are, there's so many different models. There's a model out there that's called the medicalization model. And the in like Denver right now, or Colorado has an, a ballot initiative that if it passes, it will decriminalize five medicines, but it will create a state legalized framework to provide psychedelic medicine to adults 21 and over. Sounds like a great thing. Many of us think it's a great thing because it will ex enhance the uh, access to psychedelics, but it's doing it through these business controlled health centers. So as an entrepreneur, it's like, okay, I like that. But the many of the opponents are saying, well, that's lovely, but these should be free. This is nature. Mm -hmm. You are regulating and capitalizing on nature and that's not right. So you should make nature free for those who want to gather it. And you should have business available for those who don't and want to have a, an experience packaged for them. But they both have to come together. And there's, a, there's the practicality of how do you make that work. Then you get into the whole, the medicinization of it. How do you make sure that this particular type of psilocybin that I'm giving is the exact same as the next patient, as the next patient, as the next patient? That costs money. So it takes investment. And then you get into who are going to be the guides and the people keeping you safe and who's going to be in the room and how do you do that? How do you charge for it? So there's lots of different questions when it comes to the business of psychedelics. But what I will tell you and every other entrepreneur listening is I have never in my entire career building businesses seen more need for entrepreneurs than the mental health, that are mental health care in America. Every single direction I look, there is a problem that needs to be solved. Mm. And a hundred businesses, a thousand businesses can be created on top of which, and the reason I'm, I, again, I'm talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs here, right? So any of you can go start a competing business. And that's, I think that's fine because we're talking about millions upon millions upon millions of people who for 50 years haven't had another choice. So there's plenty out there. And then finally, the kind of the esoteric or more uh, the high level discussion is, I believe this helps change consciousness. I hope it makes, it helps us relate to each other differently. I help us connect differently to that through these medicines, we unlock the way we think about disarming uh, people and feeding people and housing people. So mm -hmm. the more people who are, in my mind, who, who are unlocked, the better world we live in. So I'm, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurs getting in here and, and there's, there's no shortage of ways that you can add value. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, fascinating. And, and thank you for sharing all this uh, today because uh, I think I'm the perfect example. Uh, the person you're talking to, I, I don't know nothing about it. I'm just being hearing a lot. Last question I'd like to ask you for today because I've been hearing that as well a lot. And no later than last night, having dinner, with some friends, one was sharing that uh, he was doing micro dosing. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> so micro dosing, super popular now, is when you take a sub perceptual dose of typically either mushrooms or LSD. So we're talking about one tenth to one twentieth of a dose, a very, 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 very small amount. When you dial it in correctly, you don't feel it. So you can work, you can drive, you can do all the things that you do. You can drive? On that? Absolutely, yeah. If you've done it correctly, if you've done it to where you don't feel it, and it's this little team, again, hang on, disclaimer, I'm not telling you to drive and do drugs. That being said, when people mm -hmm. microdose, many times they're driving and doing all the things that they're doing because you can't feel it. And then there are two different, uh, I'm just gonna dive into microdosing. There are two different protocols that people typically follow. One is by a gentleman named Paul Stamets, and his protocol is you would take mushrooms typically stacked with like a lion's mane, he's got a uh, niacin, and you do that four days in a row, and then you take off for three days, and you do that for about a month, and then you take a two-week break. And then there's another guy named Jim Fattyman, who wrote the Psychedelics Handbook, and he proposes that you take it on day one, it's still in your body on day two, you let it come out day three, and then you repeat. And you kind of process that cycle for a month and take two weeks off. I'm going to tell you what we'll do. I'll, I'll put, I have a free guide to microdosing and I'll put it on my website at uh, mattzeman.com slash the business of meetings. 
So Matt Zeman, Z-E-M-O-N dot com slash the business of meetings. It'll be a PDF free download. And then this will have both those protocols in it. And I'll talk about kind of how do you dial in your dose and then, uh, and kind of what is the latest research on, on this, but it, the underlying premise is that, okay, if psychedelics at a large dose can help you with creativity and connectivity, if you take a little dose, is it still going to have a little bit of effect in the body? And the research is, is mixed. There's definitely research that says it does. And there's research that says it's less conclusive. So, uh, yeah. So take a look at all, look at all that, but microdosing is, is hugely popular for the women listening. There's a book called a really good day, really great day. Can't remember if it's good or great, but this is a, uh, a person who chose to microdose for 30 days and write about it. And she does it in this really, uh, a, a pretty fantastic way. She, she the New York times, uh, did an article on this piece and she talks about how this like saved her marriage. So, uh, worth reading if you're thinking about microdosing. Wow. Why is it only for women? It's not, it's just, cause I, I don't know why I said that. I'll take it back. It's for anybody. Great book. <laughs> It's just she she has a, a woman's perspective, which I think was super refreshing. My, a lot of the books in our space are, are written by men. And, I, and yeah, I, thank you for calling that to my attention. And then you have uh, your book, uh, Psychedelics for Everyone. That's true. And that is a, a beginner's guide to everything of how these medicines are used for depression and anxiety, OCD, eating disorders, substance use, expanding consciousness. And the audio book comes out next week. Super exciting. So if you don't like reading physical books, you can, uh, you can listen to, uh, to us all reading the book to you. Awesome. Listen, I am very uh, fascinated by what you're saying, especially for treating PTSD and, and all this element. So anyway, um, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to speak with me today. And uh, Enlightening me and maybe some others as well about uh, what is uh, psychedelics and how it can be used. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, EO event. Next EO event, Eric. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with me today. Fascinating. And uh, I must say that I'm totally uh, blown away with the statistics of 67% of PTSD case being uh, treated by MDMA. That's Amazing. Um, if you want to connect with me, ladies and gentlemen, please join me on LinkedIn or join my Facebook group, www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you find this conversation interesting, please share it with your network. Thank you. Bye-bye.